Lauren Snell here. Welcome back to High Intensity Business, the podcast where we talk about how to get more clients, retain more clients, increase spend per client, and grow your high intensity training business. This is episode 404, and today's guest is Melissa Gunn. Melissa is a certified super slow instructor, a certified exercise specialist, and a fitness and nutrition coach. She has two decades of experience in the health and fitness industry, has worked with thousands of people over the past 20 years to regain and rejuvenate their health. And today is the founder of Pure Strength LA, which has helped men, uh, women and men over 40 gain optimal well-being. She discovered slow cadence, high intensity strength training, and immediately found this technique to be in a class alone. Now, I was only going to read that, Melissa, but I love this bias. So I'm reading the whole thing. <laughs> Melissa found that many people were either not getting results when they went to the gym on their own or were getting injured. She's devoted to sharing her expertise and helping her clients to injury free and feel stronger as they age. Melissa is passionate about sharing the importance of being truly healthy, educating her clients as they so they feel this passion, experience it, and come to believe it for themselves. Very important. Melissa founded Pure Strength Filet in 2004, which stands as a private, exclusive personal training studio. Its core principles are simplicity, efficiency, and balance to give individuals the very best personal training in a private and focused environment. Their mission is to educate people over 40 how the goal of gaining strength in the foundation is the foundation of your health regimen and the number one factor in healthy aging. They've been honored to be featured in numerous Los Angeles publications such as Angelina Magazine and Valley Magazine, as well as being targeted in new segments for local news, news stations and recently launched virtual training to benefit clients outside the greater Los Angeles area. So, Melissa, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. You are very welcome. I'm excited to talk to you and learn a little bit more about your story. Obviously, you've only been, I think you, you might have been familiar with the podcast for some time, but I've only really know much about you and and the last few months or so um and the first question i had for you is just reading your bio really it sort of popped out to me is the super slow certification so when did you firstly when did you first hear about hit and super slow because here's the thing right it's still such a niche industry there's a very few people in this space relatively speaking and so i'm always fascinated like what's the trigger event what's the first thing that that got you into this way of training yeah, um, I was actually in college, um, 1996. I was a nanny, and the mother of the little girl I watched owned a uh, hit studio. Like a Nautilus, and Nautilus studio. All yeah. Nautilus in there, yeah. everything. Um, trained by Ellington Darden, like very authentic. And um, I asked her one day, because I was trying to figure out, what do I do when I go to the gym? You know, how do I get healthier? How do I get stronger? And I asked her what I could do. And she invited me into the studio. She took me through a workout and she, for the next year or two, I trained with her and it changed my life. It left such an impression on me that I decided, I think two to four years later, this is what I want to do. So, mm, wow. Yeah. And here's the thing, right? So there were many, 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 many Nautilus centers all around the US at that point. I don't know whether at that point they were there were less maybe. I know that was more kind of the 70s and 80s where they really took off. Um and I'm assuming that many people who you know own these places and using these machines weren't necessarily doing it the Arthur Jones way or the quote unquote sort of high intensity training way. They may be doing it more the I don't know Arnold Schwarzenegger way or fill in the blank, you know, um bodybuilding influence or what have you, or health and fitness guru influencer. So was this particular mentor of yours, was she kind of of the high intensity training cloth, so to speak? And yeah, but she, D Ellington Darden is her mentor. So oh, okay. She, yeah, sorry you said that. <laughs> that's okay. Um, yeah, and it was more five seconds and five seconds then, and then it evolved to 10 and 10. And now I think we're moving back kind of towards the five, five, right? Everyone does it a little differently, but yes, it, it's still those basic principles of moving slowly and keeping it safe and effective. And yeah. I still do that today. Yeah. Awesome. So, so you had the, she was the influence, the inspiration. And then when was it after that, that you got certified super slow? Let's see. I might have been in 2000, somewhere in there, somewhere between 98 and 2000. Yeah. By a master super slow instructor. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Who was that? Do you remember? 
Um, Charlie Abel. Yes, I definitely remember. Uh, he, um, actually trained my husband. My husband was one of his test subjects for a full year, and he helped him gain a lot of mass. And um, how much? I don't remember. I we could. Add, I, I don't remember, but he really <laughs> had significant results. It was really great. And um, he worked out at this studio. He trained people at this studio. So he would train me sometimes. And my husband was one of his direct subjects. So, and I stayed with the owner mostly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I don't, a uh, name rings a bell, um, but that's all I can really say on that. Do you remember any of your, I don't know, colleagues who went through at the same time as you? Anyone that we would know? I don't remember any of that actually. No. Long time ago. <laughs> yeah. It was a long time ago. Yeah. Was it the most rigorous uh, course or, or, you know, program you've, you've been through an exercise? Yeah, he was pretty strict the way he tested me. and um, But I was very passionate. I mean, I remember when I was like, this is what I want to do. I devoured the information, you know, and I and I was with them, always asking them questions and really just being there. I learned so much, even down to how she greeted clients and how she was with each person that came in. It mm. it stayed with me over to this day, really. So okay. okay. And in yeah. terms of the super slow course, how long did that take you? Just from, uh, start to finish, roughly. Um, well, I had a lot of time at that time because when I decided I want to do this, I quit working and full everything went into this is what I want to do. I'm giving it everything. So I want to say it took me maybe two months or something, but I really okay. put everything in there. You went, yeah. you went intense on the, on the course. Yeah. What did you do before this then, before getting into this? What was your, um, well, I have a degree in sociology. I wanted to go to law school. I was working for a nonprofit when I decided I don't want to do this. This is what I'm passionate about. This is what I'm going to do. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. And was there a for-profit motivation in there? Or was it more about helping people or a bit of both? <laughs> both but definitely <laughs> Fair enough. after having that experience i was grant doing grant writing and events and i thought this is not i don't want to do nonprofit work <laughs> so yes but then also i thought i'm going to follow my passion and i never looked back once i did that so sociology right so the study of what people and anthropology and that kind of thing so has that been useful in the business oh, i use it every day yeah. Every day. I mean, you're just connecting with people, seeing how people respond to things. Absolutely. It yeah. did not go to waste. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a whole area that I feel I could do with some work in, to be honest. You know, having a conversation with a few of our colleagues recently about dealing with individuals who have, let's say, a chronic injury that needs rehabilitation. But uh -huh. once they've been exposed to the stimulus on the injury even if it's um fine during the session let's say they get like a flare up the next day and they feel right. pain for the next few days and it's an issue right because what happens is the client goes to their osteopath or their physio or whoever who says stop lifting weights when yes. <laughs> when the way i understand it and i'm not a major expert on these things to be honest it's something i'm still learning about is that person has to go through a process where that pain is almost necessary to rehabbing and strengthening the area. I mean, you probably know far more about this than I do, Melissa. Um, and um, you know, it's 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 having the ability to like if you just use reason, it's not always effective. It's having the ability to empathize with the individual. You can't just say there are other health professionals don't have a clue. Um, yeah. and, and no. the, you know, our colleagues are really educating me on that. And it's something that I need to, or we, as a, as in terms of the company I represent, we need to get better at. So, yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. It's an issue that does come up and I have learned over the years, like there is a way to finesse that. And it, it like, I want to say they don't know what they're talking about, but I can't them, just backfire on me. Right. So I, there's a lot, I find too, a lot of preparation beforehand helps so they have my information in their head before they go to those people as well. But it, it's challenging. <laughs> How might you prepare someone just on that question, actually, uh, for that type of conversation? If you, yeah, if you could elaborate. Just, you know, like a lot of that comes down to, um, it could be education we've done beforehand. Even when they first come in for the initial consultation, sometimes that may come up and we prepare them like, hey, this is what you're going to experience. This is what 
you may notice. So they don't associate, like we'll say, you know, if you feel pain, you're usually going to feel it during the workout, right? So we explain things like that before Mm -hmm. something happens. So they have that already in the back of their head and they have that trust with us when something like this comes up. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, we've had well, we've had two instances where the individuals was a shoulder and a lower back, and during both they loved the workout. Like they were just blown away by the workout. They probably had some, well, from my experience, some acute um, pain inhibition, like you know, actually reduced pain um, mm-hmm. because there wasn't any there wasn't any pain during. And I just noticed for myself and when I train clients, if they do have pain, it typically goes away in the short term. But with these two particular clients, because of the type of injury they had or whatever, the next day it really flared up. And as to my last point, it's about, you know, so I've talked to some of my colleagues about this in terms of, um, you know, the, the, the trying to break that negative feedback loop. So there might be no damage there physiologically, but the brain doesn't really know that. And you're trying to retrain the brain that this movement's safe and that we can do this and it's okay and kind of push right. past that. Yeah. And so, so even though we had prepped them on DOMS, you know, there's going to be some soreness. I think what perhaps we need to get better at is when there's an actual injury, known injury, to saying, hey, you know what? This might be really quite sore for the next few days, and that's totally normal. And we've got to continue to strengthen the the the, the muscle group and the surrounding musculature, send blood to the area, synovial fluid, all of that. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, I guess I'm, I'm trying to turn this into a question. So have you ever had one of those instances, those types of scenarios? And how, how have you managed that? Just out of interest. Um, it's really hard, I think, when it happens to do anything like that, managing it when it happens, I find it's hard because it's almost like at that point, no matter what we say, they can't hear it. Right. So So there's a lot of things we'll put out in social media or newsletters about how to manage injuries. Um, a lot of it usually is how you're sitting in a car, a repetitive motion you're during, doing during the day. We may say something and something we send out or maybe even in a time we're with the client, like, hey, remember that when these things happen, this is what you can expect. So they don't think that it's from the workout. You yeah, know, it's like, so complex. The pain is so complex. Time, yeah. If you have, like, if you're sitting all day, well, maybe anything can exacerbate if you're having back pain or hip pain. And this is why you want to strengthen it. So we kind of try and head it off beforehand because once it happens, it's like, I just feel like when I'm in that situation, there's, it's hard to say anything. They've already decided in their head. Do you know what? You're so right because I've had this happen and I'm like, right, I've got to put together the ultimate email now. And I'm like spending all this time (laughs) and I'm trying to be really reasonable, you know, and all this. And um, in fact, you hit the nail on the head because these colleagues who I was discussing this with gave me some incredible advice. And a lot of it was around education. Just keep educating them in a, <laughs> in a productive way, maybe a really evidence-based way, you know, um, depending on, I guess, the type of person they are. And, and just be patient with them. And maybe let's say they can. So maybe they'll come back if they're still on your email list and they're getting that communication or they're still on your social media or what have you. So yeah, I think you've got yeah. the right right approach there. Yeah, I agree with them too. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I love that little uh, digression. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I know a few high intensity training businesses in Los Angeles or no, a few in California. I'm really terrible and ignorant about my geography of most of the united states but um, especially california la um, i did a funny podcast last week with a lady in australia and we were talking about paid google ads and she's like a master of paid google and it's one of those uh tactics that works quite well in our space obviously and so i figured you know bring that bring that to to the podcast and we were trying to uh, talk about a case study in Los Angeles, and we were both just shockingly bad at our geography of, and it, it's it's laughable. Um, so anyway, with that said, um, I'm really curious. What's it like trying to grow a high intensity training business in a very famous place like Los yeah. Angeles? Yeah, they're like? literally, well, we are on Ventura Boulevard. So in which I don't know is if that you know fancy you place? Know. Is it? It is a huge boulevard that runs through basically the San Fernando Valley where there are 
there's a gym on every corner. I mean, it is like, yeah. So there used to be even a gym upstairs in our complex from us. And so I quickly realized it's really about who I am, who my team is, what I'm presenting as a business and the quality of service we provide and how we're connecting with people. And it's like, I think that is what ultimately sets us apart because it is, it can be competitive if you think about it, but there's plenty of people for everybody, right? So yeah, it's just, there's going to be certain people who connect with us. And that's what I focus on, what I'm providing out there. Yeah. And maybe this is, you're saying this as well and what you're saying there, but to me, it's like, how are you different? I mean, that's the main thing, right? And it, thankfully, it's so easy for us to differentiate in our niche. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then above that, I think it's the quality, you know, like okay. keeping that quality, not compromising that. Okay. Okay. So do you think, so, so, I mean, ha, ha, just curious, I don't know if you know these numbers off the top of your head, but like in your, I don't know, um, area, like how many people are we talking about? Cause you said, oh, there's plenty of people. Like, what does that mean? I'm trying to get an idea of numbers. Here. I know this. <laughs> would you say, no, but would you say in the, in the millions or hundred thousand? Yes, definitely the millions okay. for Los Angeles. Yes. There's yeah. a lot. Of, yes. <laughs> okay. And a lot of people. Yeah. What'd you say? There's Sorry, a lot no, of people. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, there's a, I mean, it is a very compact, there are a lot of people in Los Angeles. Absolutely. So how was that? Like when you were getting started and you were growing this business in LA, was that not super daunting? Oh God, look how competitive the landscape is. I know you've been doing it for a good while now. No, it's okay. Even in the beginning, I just never thought about it. I just decided I am I just kind of stay in my zone. This is what I'm doing. And I just keep going forward. So I think if I do that, I would feel intimidated or discouraged, but I just, I just kind of focus on what I'm doing and keep going. I love that. Do you ignore the competition? You don't even look at them. Um, I know they're there. Even when I opened my place, I went and I worked out at different gyms. Um, I, I keep an eye on it, but I really, I don't watch the social media. I, yeah. I, I don't, I just do what I do and I keep going. I think that's healthy. I think that's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> interesting. Yeah. yeah. Cause I know, you know, it, there probably isn't, like you say, enough for everyone and if you're so strongly differentiated, I'm sure you're absolutely fine. And your, your business has proven that, but um, yeah, I can imagine, you know, if you, let's say you don't do much on social media and then you look at some, some, you know, local company who's got like just investing thousands in social media and it looks really good production. And you could look at that and go, Oh, you know, um, how can I compete with that? But then I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking out loud here, I guess. I know from talking to people that have like massive social followings and that kind of thing that a lot of the time they they generate nothing from right. from all of this all this resource invested in this kind of thing. So anyway, yeah. I'm um, I'm waffling a bit there, but uh, I just I just think it's uh, like I'm in a place in Galway where it's the complete opposite. There's much less people and there's much less competition. Um, I mean, there are other cha- other challenges, but there is still obviously fitness is big everywhere so it's still challenge but it's it's almost it's very different i mean i know that i if i see someone uh, i see another business doing something or having a win i, I get a little bit a little bit jealous you know and I, yeah. I i have to kind of like i have to kind of like check myself in those moments to realize that's not benefiting me or whatever um and it can be discouraging you yeah, know and yeah my for me i feel like it takes my energy away from what i'm doing in the first place so I don't want yeah. to do that. <laughs> no, I totally, I love that. I think you've got the right, the right mindset. That's great. Um, so what else can you tell me? Like I, I, I you said it's really busy. So the, 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 the street you're on is like very, very popular. Um, what's the, what's the culture like? Like what's give me like a, I don't know, like an overview of what it's like trying to grow this business in, in Los Angeles. If you'd love to hear you just elaborate on that for a bit. Well, it's great because there's a lot of restaurants around us and a lot of um, clothing stores. So it's like Ventura Boulevard is where all the big stores would be Um, like free people, uh, like all the top clothing stores are on there. Then you have a lot of top restaurants. If you're a restaurant, you want to be on Ventura Boulevard. Um, People, I love Studio City because there's a good community there. There's people walking around. Um, 
you know, they're with their dogs, with their kids. So there's a lot of like motion around us. So mm-hmm. um, it's a really fun play. I mean, I've loved it. There's it's beautiful really weather, very warm. Oh, it's well, right now we've had a really cold winter, but probably compared to maybe where you are, it's still pretty warm. But well, yeah, we're going to be later this week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> yeah. So for everyone. <laughs> 70 what'd you say what's it going to be for you uh well right now i don't know in fahrenheit what it is um to be honest with you i'll check right now galway weather four degrees centigrade which is what is that in fahrenheit i'll do this very quickly sorry podcast (laughs) listeners that is 39.2 fahrenheit right now in galway so it's a little chilly but it's even colder probably in Minneapolis where we're all going to be in a few days. So um, everyone listening, if you want to meet me and Melissa, the, the famous Melissa Gunn in person, you got to get yourself to the resistance exercise conference.com. So don't forget to join, to sign up. Um, Ventura Boulevard. So it sounds like a very affluent area, very prestigious place where yeah. you want your business so that's good for you, right? Because you, there's a lot of high-end retailers, high-end restaurants. So lots of yeah, people with lots of the, money, basically. Well, a lot of the studios are there too, right? So CBS Studios is there. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, a lot of the studios are right around us. So it, do you train within, lots of, do you train lots of like famous people, well-known people? Uh, we have like a lot of famous people, a lot of writers, producers, oh, wow. people like that. Yeah. Uh, casting directors. Can yeah. you share anyone's names or are they all confidential? No, I never share anyone's name. <laughs> I never <laughs> share anyone's name because I really, I do respect their privacy. I won't even ask them for, for, for social media. I don't want to ever feel them to feel like I'm using them that way or name dropping, but they're wonderful, wonderful people. So Fair enough. I bet you some of them would love to do that though, to help you out. Yeah, I've never asked them that. I feel awkward. Yeah, I mean, it, I just feel like it's your, well, it does feel a little awkward to me, but I feel like they're here to work out and I don't I want them to feel like I'm using them. I respect for, that. You know, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, do you have any, do any of them have to like train under like an alias or anything like that? Like they can't use anyone like that? Not they, nothing no? Like, nothing like that. No. no, no I mean, no. because okay. I remember I'm, it's very private. I mean, I am, probably three doors back from the main boulevard. So I'm in a shopping center. So I'm three doors back. Okay. And um, it's very one-on-one, two-on-one. It's very, or let's see, one-on-one, but not more than usually two or three people. in the, Well, actually we keep it to two people in the studio at a time at the most right now. So mm-hmm. it's very private. And if those people come, they come with their wife or their spouse or you know, they, they keep it private and they make that known. And so we respect that. Yeah. Fair play. And uh, let's talk about the business model for a second. So, because this is kind of a neat segue into that. Um, so what's the business model in terms of session length, the type of services, just to give the listeners an idea of how you've kind of like, you know, um, designed your business. Yeah. Um, well, we run on 30 minute time slots. So everyone runs back to back, you know, 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, now it's different for each person. Some people like to take up that whole time. Some people want to get in and out of there in 20 minutes. Right. So we kind of tailor it for each person. Uh, recently I switched over all the machines in the studio and I, um, have now like a section that adds to people's workouts. Right. So we have, I don't know if you have, you heard of a Jubit micro impact platform. Uh, not really have to elaborate on that for me. It's a, I love it. It's a platform you stand on. It's not a vibration platform, but you stand on it. It's very subtle vibration. And we got it for, you know, improving bone health. So that adds to the strength training we're doing. Um, There's a lot of research too with it. It helps with joint pain, recovering from workouts. Cause I think most of the listeners, our niche is really 45 to 70 years old that we work with. So it helps them with recovering from workouts. So we'll have them sometimes stand on that before their strength training for 10 minutes. And then we do a strength training workout. Um, Mm -hmm. And we find it really helps them a lot, especially with joint pain and osteoporosis. People are really finding some great things with that and the weight training as the combination. Interesting. Yeah, it's really neat. And then we have a PMF machine, which helps with recovering from injuries and reducing inflammation. 
And that's just like a mat you lay on. So that just really, and it boosts energy. So it really helps with anything that may come up that you need just a little help with, with inflammation and recovering from an injury. Okay. Um, you have a Carol bike, which I know most of your listeners know what that is. Yeah. And so people may come in twice a week to ride the Carol bike. And again, that's great because you're doing eight minutes and 40 seconds instead of a 45 minute run, easier on your joints, people like that. Um, and then we have a fit 3d body scan. So, and that gives you like a virtual avatar and I think over a hundred measurements. So that really helps us track people's progress. Yeah. Um, yeah. Excellent. So, so that's based, and we do that all in 30 minutes. So whatever you want to do, we slot it all in your 30 minute time. And then if you want to ride the Carol bike or come for the Juven another two times a week, we'll do that too. So, okay. So how does it work then? So I come in for my 30 minute session. Do you have a workout card for me of my exercises on it? What, right. I still do workout cards. I can't go electronic, but yes, right now we have. Workout You're not cards. alone. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> that's good to hear <laughs> and and uh we're, we're not even on cards we're on paper i'm trying to upgrade to cards <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you <laughs> now i, am, I really um, like the workout card <laughs> i'm uh I, I should say i'm obviously an advocate for strength portal because i've had matt the founder on a bunch of times and strength portal is a very it's very popular software among our colleagues finally someone who's cracked it someone who's actually seems to have cracked hit training software um so we are looking to move to that uh, at some point i am um, interested in that. i'll tell you that for sure because yeah. i know i'm gonna have to make this move you know yeah it's a no-brainer uh, i i think like we are startup mode but we'll probably be looking to move to it q3 q4 this year something like that but i think for an established business like yours uh, i would say it's it's yeah a, a good fit for sure you should check it out um let me ask you, uh, so, okay, so I've got my workout card of my machines and then I come in for my workout and I say, Melissa, you know, today I want to do a bit of Carol, I'm going to do a bit of that mat you described, a bit of PMF, and then I might do a few machines. Do you have to just kind of like like wing it or, or change it on the fly? Is that is that how it works or is it more structured than that? Yeah, go ahead. Very structured. When they come in for the initial consultation, we listen to what Mm. their concerns on what the, what their goals are concerns are what their goals are and then we design the program for them mm. so and if they say oh i really like to try that carol bike okay we'll add that in and maybe it's during your session and maybe we don't do a leg press because that would probably be too much or we'll come in and we'll do it another day or if the leg press is still really light in the beginning maybe we'll try that. it's it's different for each person we Got it. We'll, we'll tell you like what's the best thing for you usually, you know? So if, oh, okay. So you do the consultation, you then design the workout experience, what that looks like. But then if someone says in a workout, Hey, actually, I want to try that toy over there. You'll just modify it for the next session, potentially depending on a few factors that you described. Yeah. yeah. If it's right for them. I mean, right. if it's not, we'll explain why, if it's a low back machine and it's your third session, I'm not going to add that in, you know, mm -hmm. and we're going to explain why that is, but we're going to take note that you want to strengthen your back. And we'll help you get there, and that you know we'll we'll add that for you. But most so you you, you never start anyone on a lower back. Apologies, I didn't mean to cut you off. I rarely do that. No, that's okay. I rarely do that. I'm going to start you out on like usually most people. Let's say the leg press, the pull down, the chest press, or something like that. The easy compound movements. And once you get your form down, and I get to know you. And I know you don't have back issues and you're not a sensitive person, then I'll put you on the low back eventually. But I'm not going to, and I'm going to explain to you why that is. And then even when we do put someone on the low back, it's a lighter weight at first. We're not going to yeah. increase you, right? So, and we explain that because people often will say, it's really light. I think I can do more. Fantastic. You feel that way. That's going to happen every week. We're going to be increasing you, but this is why we're starting you out light. People say that to me and I'm like, Go into flexion right now and come out of there so I can barely see you move. And now tell me if it's too light. Right. <laughs> you, know, you know, like like creep out that. the bottom like so slow. Cause like, yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. I had one client, I had it up so heavy for him. This is really when we got started, but I didn't have much idea what I was doing. And he was just throwing the weight back. And I thought, this is not right. He's doing like almost like 280 pounds or something on the lower back. Like even now, I think I do like 200, 210, maybe a bit more. Yeah. Um, and I just, I just 
reduced the weight right down, had a slow right down, totally different workout experience. So I get that. Um, okay, so you, in the beginning, you might only have clients do like a big free then. Sometimes. Wow. A lot of it depends on how coordinated they are and how sensitive they are, right? So if, if I have somebody who's really intense and they can handle more and they have really good form, absolutely I'll add other machines, but it probably won't be more than six machines, right? So, and then we'll definitely be a leg press, a pull down and a chest press. But I have someone who's very sensitive. They can hardly move any weight on the leg press. That's already a shock for them, I think, in the first workout. And I want them coming back and craving more. And I want them feeling taken care of that we're not going to hurt you. And we're going to explain why we're only doing this and how we're going to progress forward. Hmm. Okay. Um, can you go through your machines? I'd love to hear the whole kind of repertoire of machines that you have, like resistance machines. Yeah. So we, so two years ago, I switched out all the machines. We sold all the medics and I bought a lot of Panetta and Atlantis. So I pretty much have Panetta and Atlantis now. Why did you do that? um, I felt like we'd had medics for 20 years and maybe it was 18 years at the time. And I wanted to come in back from the pandemic with something new. And and I thought, you know what? I can still get a lot of money for my medics. I'm going to sell it now and I'm going to upgrade to these machines and let's see how we do, you know? Um, So I just thought this is the opportunity. This is the time I want to do this. Um, So that's what I did. And I love my machine. So I have a pet, I have an Atlantis leg press. I'm really easy on the low back and the knees. I have a Atlantis pendulum squat. Um, which I love. I love it. It's snow loading on the spine, right? Okay, um, this is the one with the shoulder pads, right? I think I've seen that. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, yeah. It feels okay. really good too. Okay. And you know, some people can come all the way down. A lot of people only get halfway. That's okay. We we kind of ease them in because it can be a scary machine mm. uh, for some people. We have the gluteator, which I'm sure a lot of your listeners are familiar with that. I love the gluteator. It's, it's a machine. Is that um, just a quick question? Is that like because I'm for obvious reasons? Is it more popular among the female clients? Actually, male too. Because again, really? we educate them on how great you know mm. how important it is to have strong glutes. Why is it important? So we talk about mm-hmm. that. And if they have, let's say, back pain or some issue, we talk about why the glutes are important to have strong. And we mm-hmm. talk about the loss of muscle. So like we'll tailor our initial consultation towards that. Or even if we don't put them on the gluteator right away before we put them on that we're going to educate them okay this is why it's important for you to work these muscles this is how it affects your body so a lot of men actually love that machine interesting i love the focus on education that you have yeah, yeah. i think it makes a difference because it also prevents a lot of questions later for us or a lot of doubts right a lot of skepticism yeah. you know? i always remember luke luke saying luke carlson see of discover strength for those that didn't know, um, saying, you know, they have to understand the why behind the workout. And we always assume that everyone gets it and then we don't educate. And then they leave a few months later or maybe even like a year later and go and do CrossFit. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that happens. You did a good job. <laughs> right, right. It's not happened to me, but it happens in our industry. <laughs> well, we're learning for all of us in our industry. And I continue to refine it every day, but it is something I'm very aware of. Is And I have found, like, I used to get the question about cardiovascular. Well, how's this a cardiovascular? How am I working my heart? Well, we do so much education on that now from the initial consultation, social media newsletter. All of our clients know and they get it now. Can I put you on the spot? Can I ask you how you do that? Because it's always something I'm looking to (laughs) hone. Well, we just really like a lot of it may be in a social media post or a newsletter post where how this is a cardiovascular workout. And you know, the heart is a muscle, the stronger your heart is, the more efficiently you're pumping blood and oxygen, right? So that's key. And don't forget your heart's a muscle, right? And a lot of people don't associate strength training with um, a cardio workout, but your heart doesn't know whether you're on a treadmill or you're lifting weights, all it knows is being challenged. So if you're out of breath during your workout, that's a good thing. That's what you want. And so a lot of times people come in and they'll feel like, Oh, I'm out of breath. I'm out of shape. No, you worked up to this point. Like, way to go. We couldn't do this when you first walked in because we were focusing on the form and we were getting to know your body. Now you're out of breath. These mach- This is getting harder for you. 
that intensity is what's going to get your results. Yeah. That's what you want. That's your gauge is if your heart rate is up. And so people kind of understand and they get, and then they crave it. Right. Yeah. 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 And no, that's, that's great. That's a great way of explaining. It. Actually, I don't often refer to the heart as a muscle in my little bit of pitter patter, but I might, um, might start incorporating that more. Um, Going back to your machine. So we got to the gluteator. What's next? Okay. So we have a Panetta pull down. Um, mm-hmm. What I love about that machine, it's a, a grip hands facing each other, right? Okay. So it's parallel. Like, yeah. People, yeah. Um, we have a high row. Yeah. Um, Panetta high row. Uh, we have a Panetta chest press, a Panetta seated dip, and a Panetta overhead press. Okay. And the chest press, I think I've seen that is where it's quite a wide hand grip and it doesn't converge like the medics. It sort of comes out just straight, right? Am I thinking the right one? Um, you're pushing straight out. Yeah. And you do hands facing each other or like a typical Got chest it. press grip. How do you find that machine? I like it. I like yeah. it a lot. They're very smooth machines. Yeah. Okay. Um, do they have do they have the kind of resistant curves? built in with the, like you know obviously like they do with the the medics and nautilus in terms of the difference in resistance they're a little different um okay. so a lot of times we'll do five to seven seconds on the way out five to seconds on the way back but they're right. very smooth very similar yeah okay but, okay oh so it's it's, it's very yeah. smooth but it is they, they are different from the medics machines so it, we had a adjustment and there's a learning curve for us yeah Even how did your not the right. same as the typical medic. So we had to learn that. A How did your bit. clients react? Again, it all came down when I realized to how I presented it to them. Yes. Educating them. I did a lot of research on these machines, and this is why I chose these. And with each machine I chose, I had each of our clients in mind, right? So I would like, I thought about you when I chose this machine. You know, it was mm-hmm. just really all about making them feeling taken care of and educating them through the process. This is so interesting because obviously a lot of our colleagues are really married to the Nautilus and medics, right? Yeah. And they're and, great um, machines. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, obviously there's a, there's a really romantic element to them as well. The history of these machines, Arthur Jones, et cetera. Um, and, you know, I had um, some very, I had some, I had some not very wrong word. I had some criticism when we, um, Bought all of our medics equipment and um it was it was fair because i think i was very married to the romance of it all because of the podcast and all the things that have been <clears throat> shared with me but also my own personal experiences using those machines and my uh you know my workouts over the years at places like kiza um and you know, it's it is funny because it's like we are obsessed with these machines and we put so much emphasis on them and really it is about like you said there how you position whatever equipment that you have to the client now obviously it helps to have great equipment because if you've got great equipment with really low friction and great strength curves and low Absolutely. weight travel short weight travel and all that it, it's going to help with people that aren't very skilled it's certainly going to help with the workout experience but it's not the be all and end all and Again, referring back to Luke, which I often do, um, he was on the the happy hour in the membership um, last year, and I think he said this during that 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 this. So we do like a group call every month, and Melissa, you'd be familiar with that. Um, and he said something that I think it was the I want to say, I want to say the the managing director of Kiza in Australia um, yeah. might be that might be the uh, someone else, um, and they said that the the most important aspect of their business is their people, not their machines. Yeah. Um, but it was more profound than that. I totally butchered that. It was like, because there's this emphasis on keys of training is all about the machines in, in terms of perhaps some of the outsiders might say that some of the hit industry, but actually it's, it, you know, it's all about the people and they don't lose sight of that because they know that the people and the culture and the, that run the business, that grow the business, that's the most important um, variable. And yeah. Yeah, and I just think that's important to keep in all of our minds. It's it's the machines are just one aspect of the business. They're not, you know, they're not everything in our business. There's so much more to it. Yeah, which you've yeah. kind of shown there. Well, and I think we all learned that through virtual training. <laughs> we right. had to, I relied on my machines for 
years. And then I went, Oh, nope, I've got to sell a different point, right? To get these people on virtual yeah. trainings. That How's that going? I yeah. like virtual training. I mean, it's really great because it's different. And there's a learning curve for me there because that was not my foundation, right? Um, but I've enjoyed it. And I can now, I mean, people who moved away, we can train. People who, I mean, I have a client who drives from Malibu. She doesn't want to drive last week because it was raining. Great. We'll do a virtual, you know, appointment. So it's nice to have that freedom. People travel now. Can we do a virtual training appointment at my same time or do you have another time? Fantastic. So it's, okay. I I really enjoyed it and it's different, right? So. Yeah. Can you give me an overview? I'm curious how you guys deliver virtual. Um, like the type of exercises we do or well, like the, the model, like, is it still 30 minutes? Is it always one-on-one? -on -one? 30 minutes, one-on-one. -on -one. We tried the group. We can do the group. We may branch out into that again, but it is, um, like I remember we did a group of four during, uh, the shutdown and it, it's more to manage, you know, I mean, there's a lot, yeah. So it's definitely something to get down. Um, so we do keep our virtual mostly to one-on-one -on -one right now. Yeah. Yeah. You've almost got to have, <laughs> say that again. Maybe if there's a couple, we'll do two on one. We have to be yeah. a little more, which we can yeah. do that. That's You've got to be incredibly, um, like ready to deliver some amazing corrective feedback and coaching to each one and use their name so as not to confuse one it's just not it's, it's challenging <laughs> you've really got me on your game yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah um and, and obviously if the two people are very skilled the more skilled they are the easier it is right but if they're not yeah yeah we i did a little bit of that but we we just do the 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 one-on-one -on -one now although i am i am open to virtual small group um it's just i think the scheduling is a challenging part it's a having for us it's having the staff to do that but that's a whole nother whole nother issue because i think you have to have because obviously with any group you have to have kind of those pre-booked slots as opposed to that wider yeah. availability that one-on-one -on -one has and then it's trying to find i guess enough people it's just i guess it's the same with studio right it's you're still trying to fill those blocks that you've that you've pre and scheduled for small group it's just trying to do that virtual which i guess is no no different really perhaps yeah yeah exactly but it is yeah. fun because these are all new options and ways yeah. we can grow. So to me, that's exciting. Yeah. You know? No, I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating how that's really been, I don't know, um, that's really took off since COVID, right? And everyone pivoting or a lot of us pivoting. Some of us didn't. A lot of people were like, I'm never going to do virtual. That's not high intensity training. I'm really against it. And I think that's probably the wrong decision. And to me, that doesn't make a great deal of sense, to be honest. And uh, probably a lot of fitness businesses just went out of business because they were not willing to, to pivot and do that when it aligned with everything we were already doing. Right. As long as we're using the right, you know, we're selecting exercises safely and we're coaching appropriately and all of that, using the same principles, you know. Excellent. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah and and i'm curious you know we do a lot of virtual too and do you is it is it do, the approach we sort of take is you don't need any equipment um to begin with we can use you know household props and body weight and then you sort of get them to invest in stuff over time so that they work out sort of a little bit more uh, varied and enjoyable and they can increase that intensity and progress do you follow a similar model or i'm curious how you might deviate from that I think it's different for each person. Um, we yeah. do do a lot of static exercises because they can, they're safe and they can be really intense. So we do a lot of that. Um, and then once we start working to start out, we just make it easy for them. Like just show us what you have. We'll figure it out, you know? And then as we are working with them, it's like, okay, this is what, here's the link, order this on Amazon. Right. Mm -hmm. So and we just, the, I think the easier you make it, the less intimidated they feel right because people think oh yeah. i have to have this, a bunch of stuff at home no we can work with whatever we'll figure yeah. it out melissa i've just realized we have almost come up to the end of our time we haven't even got into oh, the original questions um so can you have you when's your hard stop today uh 1 30 can we what time is it now yours your, your, your... say that again it's 12 54 right now and i have okay. to be that work? Okay, that's that's absolutely fine. So let's go for another ten or fifteen, if that's all right with you. Yeah, and um, I should have asked you that at the start of this. I do that a lot. 
Um, so let's let's go into one of these because I'm fascinated. Um, we'll see where we go. So you said it there, keep it mum and pop, even as we expand. So just for the listeners, me and Melissa were sort of talking about what are the unique things I guess Melissa could bring to the podcast in terms of, you know, um, sources of, of knowledge and wisdom. And I found this to be quite intriguing. So what does that mean exactly? Keep it mum and pop, even as we expand. Um, for me, that is keeping the quality and not compromising that. Mm -hmm. So, um, each client, we listen to them. We keep a professional relationship. Um, you know, one thing for me, as I mentioned, when I bought all the mach new machines, like as I went and tried out all those machines, I'm thinking, okay, for most people, this is going to work for this person. This person needs this, right? So I'm thinking about them. I have them in mind, right? I have a presence there. I'm connecting to them. Um, I mean, I have an amazing staff. So I love that we'll have staff meetings and they will come and okay, this is going on with this person. And, and we kind of go through like, hey, how's everybody doing, right? What issues coming up? If there's an issue coming up, like we talked about, you know, the injury, maybe there's an injury or something that happened. So we're going to like figure out how to educate them. And maybe that sparks a social media post for somebody else or a newsletter for somebody else. So we're kind of like, a lot of our content is based on our clients and what they're needing. Yeah, you're okay. So just hyper focused on your customers. Uh, yeah, and really caring. And I mean, I think a lot of people don't listen. Or I think as you get bigger, it's hard. Every time I've grown, it, I really try and be conscious of keeping that attention, like about the clients. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they've been, you know, we have clients who've been with us twenty years, right? So we want to really honor that, and we appreciate that, and we want them to feel taken care of. If I have a new instructor that comes in, I'm thinking. I mean, I make it very clear from the beginning, like this is a professional relationship. We're not on our phone, which I don't think many of us do. Um, we're not talking about ourselves. Like this is about the client and them feeling good. And, you know, we want them to feel good when they come in, but it's about, this is their time and we protect that time. I love what you said there about not talking about themselves. How do you teach that and police that? I say it right away. <laughs> Like this is number one. Well, one, I do that, right? So people may ask me about my kids and they'll, you know, I'll tell them one little thing, but it's short and I go back to them, right? So it's really, and, and people have asked me, oh, let's go out to coffee or dinner. And I politely decline because this is a professional relationship, right? And this time is about you in the studio. And I expect the same of my instructors. They should not know if you're having a bad day or, and we keep okay. it about them. It's a professional relationship. So and you I think don't, sorry, I'm just fascinated. I have so many questions, Melissa. Um, so you, uh, you won't, you won't go for like coffee or dinner with clients, that kind of, I thought that would be a, go ahead. Rarely would I ever do that. No, really? it, it is. Yeah. Because I'm, I don't <laughs> have anything wearing on our professional relationship. Like okay. this is about you, you know, and yeah, I want that. To know that. I'm, I'm terrible. I'm like, I live like right next to one of my clients. So we go for coffee like all the time. And it is, you know, what's interesting, actually, he may listen to this. I don't think he will. Um, <laughs> I don't, it doesn't matter if he does. Um, I love you, Sean. So uh, my, uh, my client, Sean, he um, recently had to, had to, uh, pause slash cancel because of uh, finances and um it's he's a friend first we were friends first and uh continue to be friends but i certainly feel there's a certain amount of guilt on his part because he knows he should keep going he knows that the investment is important but he's you know i get it like money's important and survival habits kick in and you want to kind of preserve i understand um but but he, he definitely needs to keep up his strength training and he probably won't do it himself. In fact, I know he won't because he's told me that. And, um, and I, I do f sometimes get concerned that that's going to affect our friendship because to me, I, I don't care. You know, I'm yeah. like, I'm still going to come and have coffee with your client. Not sure. It doesn't matter, you know? Um, but I think he feels quite guilty. So I can see how that can, that can be a problem. But, um, well, now I have friends who come to the studio. 
But I make it clear, like one of them was getting really friendly with one of my instructors. And I said, I just want to make sure that this time is about you and that we're packing into the workout. And so I keep it separate, anything connection I have with them. I mean, I may talk about a couple of things with them. I'm not rigid, but I really try and keep the focus on them and maintain that standard. It's important. As I said to her, I do not want anything to wear because, you know, sometimes an instructor might start talking too much and it's like, wait, 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 this is not about you talking right now. This is about the client working out. The only thing that should be said during that workout is any, if they need any direction, right. You know, anything related to the workout or then. So I completely agree with this. When you're in the studio, you've got limited time. You want to be productive, focus on the client, 100%. But I guess what I don't quite get is I would be willing, very interested, in fact, to take clients out for dinner and coffee to deepen the relationship to get more referrals as well, potentially. I mean, we've literally just had a great client of ours um, uh, provide an opportunity to me to speak to an enormous medical tech company right around the corner from our studio. And it would have been much harder for me to get that had we not developed that relationship. And it wasn't like, it was weird. It wasn't, I, you know, we, we, we had this great relationship because we just had to be very similar people with similar interests and we became good friends. And there was never an expectation. It was never like I was trying to, I was doing that in order to get this opportunity. It just kind of happened organically. Although it was on our radar, but we weren't kind of, we were thinking about speaking to this organization, but we weren't kind of thinking about, oh, we could work with so-and-so to get that opportunity, right? So anyway, I'm just curious, surely you would potentially grow your business more effectively if you were to invest in more of those relationships outside the session. But you have this thing about this professionalism, which you maintain. Yeah. I'd be opposed to that. I mean, there's a couple, like I had a client one time say, I want you to be at, you know, X company for the corporate wellness program. Absolutely. I'll go and talk to you about that. But I keep it clean and I make sure like it doesn't, we we don't become, I mean, I I think my clients love us, but it's not a friendly, I mean, it's a friendly relationship, but I'm not going to tell you all my problems or, you know what I mean? Like I keep it professional. Uh, that's that's what probably, I, I should, I should do less of that probably. <laughs> <laughs> not that they don't know things about me. A lot of my clients have even met my kids. They're, you know, they're in the studio sometimes if they have to be, but it's like, I keep it. It's very much about them and I just keep yeah. it professional. <laughs> but I, 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 to draw it, Melissa, I'm making so many errors here. It's so funny. Like hearing <laughs> well, you say that, well, no, I, I, I know it's subjective, but hearing you say that, it's like I sit there with this this friend of mine who's also a client, and he's um uh, a father of three or four. I want to say, is it four? Maybe it's four. And they're all a bit older than me, so he's further along that journey. And whenever we meet for coffee, I'm like, Sean, I can't do this anymore. It's just so hard. <laughs> These kids are the bane of my life. They're so disruptive. I can't get any work done. I'm constantly having to take time off. And so he's my therapist uh, when he's not in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> but so, it may work right I, and, you know, it is, and this is why i have my instructors keep this professional relationship i don't want anything where they feel icky or they feel weird or all of a sudden yeah. they're not going to do whatever i don't want that affecting the business and them coming there that's really I why that. i keep that line just like a therapist i think right so yeah. yeah okay okay so i like this so okay this this idea of keeping it keeping it mom and pop is just trying to make the clients feel like they're all very much cared for and that the experience is tailored around them and you're never losing sight of that as you grow. It's kind of what I'm hearing. Um, One thing I was curious about is um, this idea of obviously having a, a target market. You know, most of us have, you know, a target market who we, who we speak to in all of our messaging, who tends to be the best fit for our business. Maybe that's, I don't know exactly what yours is, Melissa, but maybe that's a busy professional female who's over 45, who makes a certain income, blah, 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 et cetera. Um, I love this idea and I find this the simplicity of this very inspiring, which is to design the business around that individual. So whenever you're buying a new machine or you're changing something to the online experience or you are training your concierge or any 
change your magnitude of business, you're thinking, how would Tara feel about that? You know, how does that fit with her particular psychographics or character traits or whatever? Um, and for us, we're kind of slowly over time um, adding color to that avatar, making it more, you know, more specific. But that's great, but that doesn't necessarily connect to what you were saying about trying to care for all of your customers because i'm assuming you've got quite a broad range you've got people in their 30s and 40s and then you've got people in their 70s and 80s so i could i personally go ahead yeah no, okay. you, you personally yeah. what well I, I think i was just thinking how how do you stay focused and make sure that you're 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 designing the business around that target market, which you were kind of nodding along. So I assume you sort of agree with that idea, but at the same yeah. time, not lose sight of the other clients. That's well, the point. Most of our people are in that, like, okay. they're 45, I'd even say, well, some are 45, but 50 to 70. Now they're coming into 75 because they've been with us for a long time. So it's, they're all kind of in there and they all have similar issues. And then there are people we know because we talk about them every week or we see them every week. So we're seeing, oh, this would be really good for, let's say, like we needed a leg curl recently. Well, we had maybe five or 10 people who really needed that. We have one guy who's at the end of the leg press already, right? So we're going to make that, bring that in, not only because we have a a good chunk of people who need it, but also because we have uh, other people would benefit, right? So we're looking Mm -hmm. at and now on the other side, we had an ab machine that I brought in that just wasn't great for probably half of our clients. So we just, we're, we're selling it now, right? And another one, it was a hip thrust, which I loved it. It was a great machine, but I'd say 70% of our clients, it just wasn't the right machine for them. So we got rid of it. We brought in, that's why we brought in the leg curl. So it's- I would it's, have kept it for yourself, I, Melissa. <laughs> My husband was really upset about that going out, but it was like, I needed to really look at what was the best thing for the business and for yeah. each person. So. Isn't that a funny thing? How you get, do you get those machines where one client is like, oh, this machine's incredible. Like I can feel the muscle like burning, like just contracting so, so well. And then another client's like, I can't feel anything. I'm like, what the <laughs> hell is with that? Um, <laughs> You know, we we recently got the Medex ab isolator, which is just unreal. Like, you know, when you when you have you used it before, we got the roller pad comes over the top. So um it's it's you've got a seat with a, a pad for the lower back. So it sits in the arch, right in the curve. And then you've got a roller pad that comes over the top and it sort of sits right here on your chest. And then you put the elbows on top and you just crunch down. Obviously, you're trying to bring your chest down to your hips, right? That's what that very really small movement that really engages the abdominal wall. And um, we we did, we had a learning curve with this machine because we had, I think we had a problem where some clients perhaps weren't feeling as much because they weren't, they were moving, they were curling forward as opposed to curling down. Um, and so now we focus more on that kind of downward motion. Anyway, when you do it the right way, it's brutal. Like I'm not even using, I'm using like, I don't know, I think this, the weight stat goes like, three, 400, and I'm using like 70 pounds on this thing and I'm barely getting 10 reps on a two, four yeah. cadence, like, and I'm getting the failure. And, um, yeah, and we just had one client in particular who just wasn't feeling. And I'm like, said to my trainer, Nigel, I was like, how is this possible? Like this, I, I can't even budge this thing. Like, <laughs> you know, she's yeah. clearly not doing it correctly or whatever. And so that was fascinating learning curve for me. And I think we, we got there in the end in terms of modifying her form and then, I think we were um, super setting it or post exhausting it with like a plank as well, just to really <laughs> make her core feel uh, engaged. Right. So, I love that. That's what makes our, uh, what we do exciting to me. You know, it's not the really? same with the person. Like it challenges us to, all right, uh, how do I get through to this person? How do I, you know, guide them through this? So can you give us, I'm just curious, just before we wrap up, Melissa, can you give us any examples where you've, Cause I'm, I'm just really keen to learn myself, like, like protocols you use to really help a client get a particular feel they want. Maybe it's like a certain combination of exercises that you guys do. I just love to get a couple of tips on that kind of thing. Anything comes to mind. I think, um, you on like the spot what, now. 
Well, now I'm just trying to think what would be an example of, I'm not really clear on uh, what you're asking. Like, yeah. So, if, well, for example, like the example I gave you there, the ab crunch, right? It's it's for this particular client. I'm not probably getting the protocol exactly right, but we might have done something like that where we we have her on the ab crunch and then she goes to failure on that. And then we have her go straight into a plank to failure, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, we all know in high intensity training that you probably don't need to work the abs directly all that much because you're getting so much stabilization in a lot of the other exercises. But we all have clients who come in and all they care about is quote unquote core strength. And then we have to educate them what the core actually means and how to actually strengthen those muscles and how actually you can't spot reduce fat. No, I'm sorry. You have to actually eat less. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, so, yes. Yes. We've all gone for that. So anyway, um, in order to make, because this is, again, this is, uh, it's, a, it's the fourth time I'm bringing up Luke, which I have a habit of doing. Um, you know, he, he, well, he's, he great. Oh, he's great. Um, he told me you know, a long time ago about the importance of, um, how the client feels not just the desired outcome in terms of stimulating maximum results but the feel they get viscerally you know from the workout right so even if you know do you need to do three sets of abs probably not but does the client really want that i want to feel that 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 like mm -hmm. burn in their midsection that soreness then yeah they do so you do it you know? <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's just what I don't know. I just I was curious if you had any kind of like go to protocols that you guys use. Maybe you do the squat that you mentioned. The was it the Atlantis or I can't remember the name of the model now. Uh, and you maybe you do that for a ten ten, and then you go straight into a wall set. I don't know. I'm just curious if you've got any things do you do like that. Any protocols? Anything that comes to mind? I love the gluteator. That's one of my favorite things. So if oh, people yeah. aren't feeling their glutes, that's a good one. We'll have them do the gluteator and we'll coach them through that. So they're, you know, not overarching their back. Right. And then mm -hmm. we'll have them go to the squat or the leg press. And, and then even if you do the low back at the end, I don't know how you can not feel your glutes. And if they don't feel it right away, they do eventually, right. Is the way it oh, increases. Wow. That's yeah. a really good um, one that I love. Cause I think there's some people who just don't, they have no concept of what that is. They can't feel their glutes when they're, pushing yeah. out right so um that's probably the biggest one i could think of um yeah that's tough yeah, the biggest one yeah. yeah yeah but you don't feel so good <laughs> oh yeah how do you like um so so we might say to a client on a machine like okay you know we'll say this this is targeting x this is targeting the glutes the quadriceps whatever and we'll say yeah focus on those muscles as you as you go through this set um because there's some there's some research behind that mind muscle connection which sounded a little bit um sounded like it one of those things that is not true like an old wives tale but i believe there's research to support that now um where you get higher recruitment by focusing on it james fisher if you're listening to this you can probably correct me on that <laughs> <laughs> or brad schoenfeld i think you actually did the, the research on it um and however to your point some clients really struggle to fill certain muscle groups. How do you guys get around that? What are your, what's your process for saying, getting a client to really feel it? Uh, well, what, what you said, we do that. We talk okay. about the muscles you're working. We talk okay. about why it's important, what, you know, how you're using this every day, why this, how this is going to affect your life. Right. Um, sometimes I will actually touch them, you know, mm. where they are, if they're comfortable with that. Most people are, um, you just got to kind of read that, I think, but, and that usually helps them too. Like, okay, these are the muscles you're working. Do you feel that? And I go, well, not really. I feel you're working that. I can feel those muscles shaking. Oh, okay. And then they start to kind of feel it usually. So, and there are people who never do. And that's just how that how they work. And we just do the best we can, you know, but usually those two will connect it for them. That's interesting. You know, you got me thinking even us you know we we obviously have strength trained for many years and there are still certain exercises i do the machines where i'm like i don't really feel it as much you know like with um the the torso arm the medic's torso arm pull down i never really feel like i'm getting a, an intense bicep and lat workout even though i'm pulling ah. right even though i'm pulling down like for me like a really i i do like um not to brag here melissa but i do yeah, i do what it's my, 
it's my podcast, <laughs> so you know I can brag a little bit. Um, but I did like four hundred and I'll say four hundred and twenty something pounds for like. <laughs> Yeah, right. And I'm not a big guy, so I'm pretty proud of that. It took me a while to work up to that. Um, there's actually a really funny video. Well, it's not meant to be funny, of Luke training me virtually. It's on YouTube. You can check it out. So he trains me in our studio when, it was, when we only had a few machines. And he puts me on the pull down. He said, okay, set it to 440. And I just burst out laughing. I'm like, are you having a laugh? And he and he's like, no, you'd be fine. And what we did is we did breakdown sets. So he wasn't expecting me to get to like 10 reps. He was like, we're going to do going to try and get to four and then when you hit four we're going to drop it by 100 pounds and then drop it by another 100 you had to do like three or four breakdown sets it was awesome i was destroyed um but yeah so i've worked up to this this weight now and i feel good about myself <laughs> but, um, that's really great weight <laughs> but the sorry the point of bringing that up was um because i don't actually I don't know. I just don't feel like a really direct, like I feel obviously physically exhausted and I do feel something, but I don't feel like, like I get a really good kind of like bicep feeling. Right. Whereas I go on the, the medics, um, arm curl, and then I get obviously a very, a very, um, potent sensation, the bicep, for example. Right. So it's, I guess it's different for different people, right. These machines. And then you've got to find those machines that people sort of re resonate mostly with people and try yeah. and design it. Yeah. Keep them in the exactly. game, right? Yeah. That's how I feel. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Melissa, I'm only conscious of your time and um start to wrap it up there. But thank you so much for taking part and coming on the show. And um, any parting thoughts, any all the you know, all the years you've been operating. Obviously, you've got people listening to this who are at various stages of the journey, some people just getting started, some people just ideating about the idea of starting with some people who are like, you know, same, same sort of experience as yourself. So from everything you've learned, what would be your kind of parting thoughts or wisdom for growing this business and uh, continuing to operate? Uh, you know, one thing I love is just, I keep learning. I mean, there's always like, I, I, I love that. That kind of fuels my passion. Cause I think we're all passionate about what we do, but like, I'm excited for the conference next um, weekend and just talking to you and, connecting with other people in our field, it's so, it fuels my passion and I learn something new every single time. Right. And I think like that allows me to expand and keep growing. Yeah. So um, I think it's really important, you know? So, so what, what Melissa is saying there is everyone should sign up for the resistance exercise conference immediately uh -huh. if they're serious about learning. <laughs> well, I'm grateful you created that because it's something yeah. that this industry really needed. Right. So, and yep. it's nice to know, oh, and this is what I love about your podcast actually too, is, oh, other people go through that. Oh, they're having these challenges. Oh, that's how they deal with this. And it just, it gives me so much every time I connect with anyone. Right. So yeah. I think it's really important. I think you're so right. It is a, it can be a very lonely business. It's a very, very challenging business. Yeah, um, and business owner. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, obviously, I hear from all uh, all of our colleagues a lot, and I hear all all the different challenges, and it never ends. There's always problems, as there is in any entrepreneurial endeavor. But even myself, as someone who had all the advantages, right? I had, I have a great business partner, I have a great little team, and um, I have all the resources at my disposal. I have the podcast, the membership. I still struggle with loads of aspects of it, and I still have to get help all the time. And I share it all on the podcast inside the membership where I can, and that's my whole mission i guess with this is to share it all so that you know our colleagues right now and people who are just getting started don't have to struggle quite so much or maybe they do but they get a solution slightly faster you know that's the yeah. whole idea yeah, learn yeah. From others. <laughs> yeah we exactly yeah yeah so. absolutely now i appreciate the kind words and um for everyone listening please subscribe oh firstly please go to melissa's website purestrengthla.com beautiful website great job and um, in terms of the podcast, please subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Subscribe on YouTube as well. And to find the blog post for this episode, please go to highintensitybusiness.com. Search for episode 404. And Melissa, thanks again. Great to have you on. Great to talk to you again. And um, we'll see you at REC. And to everyone listening, thank you very much. And uh, we'll talk to you again soon.